when I say the word nutrition, what comes to mind? Just throw things at me. I want the good, the bad, the ugly. Just start saying stuff. Food, okay, what else? Macronutrients. Macros. What else? Fuel. Supplements, fuel. Vitamins. Okay. Healthy. Okay, I like it. Recovery. Recovery. We are in a CrossFit box, aren't we? <laughs> Anything else? Anything else? Feeling good. Feeling good. Oh, I love that one. Yeah. Energy. Okay. Man, y'all are not, y'all are too good. You're not giving me. Tiramisu. Okay. Tiramisu. That one? <laughs> Ice cream. <laughs> Dessert. Okay. So one of the things, one of the things I'm looking for that you guys are so much better than I expect you to be is weight loss. I was gonna say from a coach's perspective, weight loss. Weight loss, yeah. So, the reason I bring this up right off the gate is because we're talking nutrition, we're not talking weight loss, okay? It's not to say that nutrition will not get you weight loss, but nutrition will also get you so many more things. Nutrition will get you feeling good, getting energy, performing well in the box, performing better in your life, mental clarity. One of the reasons why Tim started working with me and one of the things I got him to do, which we will talk about later, was because he was like, how do you have this much energy at eight o'clock at night? I do not understand. You are like buzzing at eight o'clock at night. Partly my personality, <laughs> I'm a little bit like that, but it's also because of my nutrition. So sleep, uh, energy, mental clarity, better sex, because usually a good sex drive goes along with better nutrition, like that, right? Um, GI issues start to resolve themselves. Inflammation, all of these things are much bigger picture of nutrition. We focus on weight loss though when we join a nutrition challenge, if you guys have ever done those before, right? Nine times out of 10, what are, one of the markers they're looking for you to do is how much weight did you lose, yeah? Well, I don't need to lose any weight, do I? <laughs> No, I need to be gaining weight. If I'm doing healthy nutrition, I should be gaining weight right now. So nutrition does not equal weight loss and we have to kind of get that through our heads. Healthy, proper nutrition can get you weight loss if that's what your body needs, but not every body needs that. Some people need to gain weight. Some people might just break even, but their body comp shifts. Or maybe they break even and they you know, aren't having diarrhea every day because there are those people too, right? So that's the thing, because you can get weight loss without nutrition. I'm sure we've all seen that, right? Those like, let's eat 500 calories a day in the form of shakes for like, you know, three weeks. And yeah, you're gonna drop weight because you gave yourself osmotic diarrhea. <laughs> that's super easy to do. So that's, I just wanna start off with that because nutrition and weight loss, especially this time of year, it's January, we've got all these challenges going on, which can be super awesome and great motivators, but so often they focus on that one singular piece of nutrition. And nutrition is so much bigger. So I wanna start there. Okay, now, he also brought up the CrossFit Pyramid. Have you guys seen the pyramid? You guys know that? Yes, no, some of you, okay. So the CrossFit Pyramid, developed by Greg Glassman, right, the man himself, the godfather of CrossFit, he put at the bottom of that pyramid, the base of that pyramid is nutrition. There's a reason for that, because it is the base of everything. It's more important than the Metcons. It's more important than the weightlifting. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> it's more important than the gymnastics stuff. It's nutrition. That's really the bottom of that pyramid. And if you've ever seen, there's another document he created called World Class Fitness in 100 Words. You may have seen that one too, maybe not. The very first word of this 100 words is eat. The first two sentences are completely about nutrition. Eat meat and veggies, nuts and seeds no sugar, enough to support your performance, not too much for weight gain, something to that effect, sorry, I don't have it fully memorized, but that's the gist of it, right? It's actually 25 words, it's an entire quarter of the 100 words of world-class fitness, right? That's how important it is. Okay, I think I've got all those things out of the way. <laughs> now we're gonna start talking about this. Again, don't worry, you're gonna get these slides, okay? Hopefully you can see them, I don't put anything on there that's too small. You see those three letters by the side of my name? RDN, does anybody know what that stands for? Yes, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist. So the N on the end, they've added that recently, but Registered Dietitian, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist, those are interchangeable. The reason that's important is because do you know 
what the word nutritionist means? Do you know what qualifications the person has to have to use that term? Zero. Zero. I can start a website and say, Kanga Nutrition. That was my cat. That's perfectly legal. She can be a nutritionist. When you go to someone who uses the term nutritionist, they may or may not have any kind of training or backing behind them. Maybe they did a weekend course. Maybe they did a six weeks course, six months. Maybe they've never worked with a person at all ever. They, it's just highly, highly variable. It's not to say that everybody out there who's using that term doesn't have some kind of qualification or isn't maybe going to help you. Just you have to be aware of the fact that that term in and of itself has no legal anything behind it. It means literally nothing. Someone can walk off the street and call themselves a nutritionist, does not matter. RDN or RD, registered dietitian, means that I have to have in the equivalent of an undergraduate degree in nutrition or in dietetics, which means I have all the classes. I have all the sciences and all of those things, right, to back that up. It also means that I, have, I had to complete an internship, which is what Tim was talking about, which means that I was in supervised practice in the hospital. RDs are the only ones who can legally do medical nutrition therapy. So if you actually have a medical condition that requires nutrition intervention, I'm your girl, right? That's what I do. That's not all I do, but that's what we're trained to do. That's what RDs are qualified for. You cannot work in a hospital unless you're an RD. And actually in the state of Texas, if you go to someone and they give you a meal plan, they write out every single thing you're supposed to eat every single day of the week, that legally can only be done by an RD. So be wary if someone's trying to sell you that because, and they're not an RD, because that, that's a, that can be a legal ramification there. The reason for that is because every single thing that they have to account for, they have to account for every single nutrient that your body needs. And if they're not qualified to do that, they could put you at a deficiency unintentionally, okay? I spent many thousands of hours and dollars doing my training. And so it's important to me that, you know, people are educated because there's so much misinformation out there about nutrition. And there's so much, um, there's so many people who, you know, for better or for worse, a lot of times when we come into a space like this, we assume our trainers are equally as qualified in nutrition as they are in, you know, the movement stuff, right? It's kind of a lot to ask them though, right? You know, I know as a woman, I'm not going to go to, you know, my dermatologist for my well woman visit, right? I'm going to go get that done by my gynecologist. We have different people for different things in medicine. We need to realize that we have to need, we need multiple different coaches in our lives too for different stuff. I do also use the term nutrition coach for myself because I do view it as coaching. Because to really make change, you need someone to come alongside you and help you, right? One session, usually not enough. Because most of us have probably not been eating that great for a long time. <laughs> We're not gonna undo it overnight. We'll talk about that more. Okay, all of the beginning stuff out of the way. What is evolutionary nutrition? Because if you saw the title of this, evolutionary nutrition. That's what we're gonna talk about today, is that concept. Because again, there's a lot of misinformation. So what is it? Well, it differs from that traditional or standard nutrition approach. We're gonna talk about, so some of the things in that standard nutrition approach, we got that, right? Macros, sups, vitamins, the idea that food is always fuel, which it is, but it's more than that. So you've probably heard of paleo or primal, yes? We're in Austin. I'm born and raised here, by the way, even though I live in Dallas now, I'm born and raised here. So we've heard of paleo or primal. Those are kind of common buzzwords these days. The problem is, is a lot of people don't really know what that means. Oftentimes it's, I heard it from a friend, from a friend, from a friend, and they're doing this and basically it's, it's low cal and they're eating a crap ton of meat, right? Like all of the meat, just cow, plate, eat. <laughs> Which is good, but you know, not necessarily really what it's about. Evolutionary nutrition is actually what paleo or primal are kind of aiming for. Ancestral, evolu or ev ancestral nutrition or ancestral health is the other term that people use there. Um, in fact, some of the big dogs in the paleo world uh, will say that they wish that they had actually used evolutionary nutrition as the term for the movement versus paleo. I wish, so we're gonna hear a little bit about the, the company that we're doing. You guys are gonna get some little freebies from the company, it's called Paleo University. I wish we could name it Evolutionary Nutrition University, but that is a lot. <laughs> and so we ended up having to go with Paleo University because it does shorten it and it gives people a generalized sense of what we're doing. But I practice evolutionary nutrition. That's how I say what I do. 
it takes into the histor and it takes into account the historical context of food, which is really important. So we're going to get into a little bit closer detail. So standard nutrition, you got biology, right? Biochemistry, organic chem, physiology, anatomy. I would argue that they don't always actually stick to the physiology like they should. There are times when the physiology will tell you you should do one thing, but the guideline says something that's almost opposite, which is kind of weird. Politics, and that's why. <laughs> that's why you might see that the physiology says one thing, but the guideline says something else. Politics come into play. Money, that's also in line with politics. <laughs> Opinions, that's a big one. So in standard nutrition, you, also, you often have people who morality, I'm gonna go ahead and say, and so on. You often have people who make food choices based on things like opinions or morality or money, and then they try and use science to back that choice up. Yeah? That doesn't really work very well. So I hope I don't offend anybody. I might. Tim and I have talked about this. Veganism is an example of this. And I'm sorry if any of you guys are vegan in here. <laughs> But people make the choice to be vegan, and that might be morality, they might, then that's fine. It might be religion, and totally cool. The science does not back up that choice, though, from a purely health perspective. It's not there. We have done a really great job of trying to find science to back it up, but it's very, there's been some tricky maneuvers that have to happen to try and back that up. So there's a difference between nutrition is a science, what you eat is a choice. And you can make that choice, and that's perfectly up to you guys, but I want you to know that there's a difference there, right? And that's part of what I'm gonna talk about is, know that these are the smart choices, these are the choices based on you know, nutrition and health, and then if you choose to do something else, do it with a whole heart, full brain, you know, do it willingly and knowingly. Don't fool yourself into thinking that Halo Top is a great idea because it's got less calories and fat. Yeah, still ice cream. <laughs> um, I would rather you actually eat real ice cream, just be smarter about the amount you do, right? Because Halo Top allows us to eat a pint every night and feel like we're doing good. No. <laughs> All right, so evolutionary nutrition. What are the things that mark it? It's got biology too, biochemistry, organic chem, physiology, anatomy. Cool. Also anthropology, also archeology. span this is where I'm gonna stop. I have a former life in anthropology and archeology. span I was a Roman archeologist prior to this life. Um, I actually studied sort of the ancient human diet. I studied the vessels of consumption, so all the ceramics and everything that survives from that era. So I did a lot of looking at patterns of consumption, how food consumption changed over time, all those other things. So that's part of why evolutionary nutrition is super appealing to me because Anthropology and archaeology. And those are really valid things to include in this, right? Like how our bodies adapted and evolved over time, that makes a big difference to what we're eating. So you've got evolutionary biology, history, and that doesn't just mean what were we eating 100 years ago, that also means the history of how we got to where we are now with food. Understanding that's important. And of course, et cetera, because you gotta say et cetera. But genetics is also something else that's in there that I don't include because I wanted my list to match. I wanted them to be the same length. <laughs> but genetics is another thing that evolutionary nutrition takes into place. My husband happens to be an MD, PhD. His PhD is in genetics. So we have lots of nerdy conversations. <laughs> no one wants to be in that house. Um, and so we talk about that quite a bit and how, you know, our <coughs> genes haven't changed. What has changed is what's called epigenetics which means that all the inputs we're putting into our body then impact your gene expression. So what I wanna do, my goal is I wanna give your body as much nutrition as possible so that it's feeding your genes the correct signals so that you get positive gene expression of the things we want and you turn off the things we don't, yeah? Optimize your genetic potential. And I don't know what that is, everybody's different, right? I will never play basketball on the professional level. Not gonna happen, those are not my genes, I can't optimize that, right? So some people who come in and they're like, you know what, I wanna be 300 pounds, like super big and strong, and I'm looking at him and he's like this big. I'm like, you know, we might be fighting a lot of genetics there. You can do it, it's gonna be a lot of work and you're gonna to have to work your butt off all the time to stay there, right? Or vice versa. You come in, 
Tim, probably never going to be like, you know, 120 pounds. It's just, <laughs> it would take a lot of work to push his body all the way to the other side. He's a big guy. That's just kind of who he is. So does all this make sense? Like kind of where those differences are and why we're, you know, looking more on the evolutionary side. So talk a little bit more about standard. Started from a really, really good place, right? So standard nutrition, we got to talk history a little bit, started from the concept of single nutrient, single disease. You solve that nutrient problem, you solve the disease. So scurvy, you guys heard of scurvy? Yeah. Sailor's disease, right? They'd go out on the ocean and they were missing something. Their teeth would fall out, it was pretty nasty. They actually believed in the beginning that scurvy was caused by laziness. Basically, you just weren't working hard enough. Well, that's because when you have scurvy, you are really tired. <laughs> so they did go hand in hand. That's a correlation, not causation. That's a big problem in nutrition science. And eventually they figured out it was, if we ate citrus, we got rid of the problem, right? Then they realized that what it was really specifically in citrus was vitamin C. So now let's get the citrus out of the way. Let's just give them vitamin C tablets, okay? So we've gone from a single nutrient issue, vitamin C, causing scurvy. Fix the vitamin C, you fix the scurvy. Yay! That's where it started. That's good, right? We had a lot of nutrient deficiencies on single nutrient side of things. Undernourishment was a huge problem, too, in our history. So World War II, this is where a lot of our stuff happened, World War II, when people were coming in for the draft, <clears throat> they were completely undernourished. Men could not enlist because they were undernourished. It was considered a national crisis of defense because we couldn't get enough men in the military. So you know what they made a food group in the 40s? Butter. Butter was its own food group in the 40s. Purely because they were like, we just gotta fatten people up, but just get the calories in them. And we're kind of still in that place of focus so much on calories and these individual things. What that's called, is nutritionism. The idea that food is eaten purely for a nutrient or a macro, right? That it's important. The reason you eat an orange, vitamin C. Oh, I'm getting sick. I gotta eat my oranges. I gotta get my vitamin C in. What about all the other things in the orange? Because now what, we have, what have we done? We bypassed the orange entirely and we just go straight for the emergency. <laughs> Why bother with that messy fruit? I might as well just pour powder in my drink and drink it, because it's the same thing, right? I argue it's not. <laughs> so, leads to processed industrial food like stuff. Yeah? Do you, is there an Oreo tree out there that I've missed somewhere? Kind of wish there was, right? Yeah, maybe. Or a Snickers tree, that would be so great, because then I could justify eating it. But sadly, no. So, these things don't exist in nature. They are food like stuff. They create foodless calories, foodless nutrition. And this has happened really, really rapidly. We're gonna look, I have like the one chart I make you guys look at, because it's kind of hard to read, and I don't wanna overwhelm. The one chart that I have in there will show just how rapidly we have really incorporated this stuff into our life. It, I mean, and we're talking decades. This has not been a slow process. So that's why we have to be careful with it. And then the rise of chronic disease. So that's part of this. So this is, my, <laughs> this is my one thing I'm gonna make you guys look at. We're talking about a bigger nutrition pattern. So I just talked about nutritionism, right? People right now are really focused on things like sugar being a big problem and carbs being a big problem. We're gonna talk about why those words are maybe difficult because an apple has sugar in it. Is an apple the reason why we have chronic obesity in this states? Probably not. Um, do you think that eating sweet potatoes is really what's getting everybody type two diabetic? Probably not, yeah? So it's not necessarily carbs and sugar, it's processed carbs and sugar, and processed fats, and processed protein, right? Fake industrial versions of these foods. All right, we're gonna walk you through this. It's a little bit complicated, a little tricky to see. So the blue line that's going up behind there, that is US sugar consumption, and it was steadily on the rise, and had been for a while. This chart overlaid is showing you our US healthcare spending as a percent of GDP. That's what all the colored bars together, that's what they are. It's broken down more, but that's basically what this is. 
you can see that for the most part, even though sugar consumption was rising, that it stayed pretty stable, but it does kind of peak and fall. So here as it peaked, it peaked when it fell during World War II, it fell a little bit. Where does it shoot up drastically? The gross introduction of processed foods into our diet. It's not sugar necessarily. It's processed foods. And that also means the introduction of high fructose corn syrup and the replacement of sugar in fat, or for fat in foods. The 90s with the low fat craze, right? Snack wells. I remember eating snack wells. We're eating them by the freaking box. What was the first like, processed food that caused it? The first one? Well, you know, generally, that caused I mean, that's a big spike in 1900. Yeah, uh, here? Yeah. Well, so this spike that's happening, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's was, sugar, actually. That's yeah. sugar consumption. That's pure sugar consumption. Um, I believe part of what that was was the um, better processing ability, especially of sugar, of beet sugar. Because when you see the word sugar, when they use just the word sugar on a label, it's either beet sugar or cane sugar. It allows them to use either one. And more often than not, they're using beet. It's cheaper but it requires a lot more processing to do. I don't know if you've ever chewed on a stick of cane. It's like sweet. You could actually process it in your kitchen and get sugar off of it if you wanted to. So the rise of the industrialization of America and the, the process. Mm -hmm. And so what happened here too, with this high fructose corn syrup coming in, was that basically there was a conversation in the government of that the rise and fall of sugar, so went the presidency. When sugar prices were super high, the incumbent was not gonna win. And so there was a whole conversation that was like, hey, we, don't, we want to maintain government like it is. What can we do? And high fructose corn syrup had just been invented in Japan. And they figured it out. And they brought it over. And it replaced it. So now sugar became super cheap because it was high fructose corn syrup and stabilized government. So anyway, the, so I don't want you guys to focus on sugar or, or any of those things specifically. Just notice processed food as a group, like as a whole. When that comes in, that's a massive rise. I have never in nutrition seen that level of corollary, right? So I believe, I might be wrong on the number, I believe the corollary is actually, it would be a three if you do the math on it. So in, when you look at cancer, it has to be like greater than 0.8 to one for it to actually, for the corollary to be strong enough to consider it causation, right? Smoking, like cigarettes and lung cancer, is something like a seven. This is a three. Most nutrition corollaries don't get above like 0 0.01. <laughs> They're super, super low. So that's really high, right? That's a really, really high corollary. Again, I might be pulling some of those exact numbers out of my butt, <laughs> but the point is the same, that it's, it's a much higher corollary than you see anything out, anywhere else. That's, to me, a very, very strong picture, right? And also that means, we're spending that on health care. That's us going to the hospital. That's drugs. That's all those other things. If you want to not spend money here, you got to spend a little money on what's going in your mouth. You got to be willing to spend a little bit of money on your food because that sets the foundation for everything. And in the end, you're going to save money there. And that's a whole lot more expensive, not only financially, but just the life and everything else that happens, right? You don't want to be one of those people who, you know, at 40 is, you know, having to take insulin because you shot your pancreas. Because everything you're doing now is going to eventually come to play. I say you're writing checks now that your body will eventually have to cash. So we got to be careful. All right. Now, clearly, <laughs> this is very complicated. I don't think you guys want to really hear me talk about the Krebs cycle, right? You don't really care about that level of detail. Maybe you do. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, so we, we're just going to make this a biochem and organic class. Screw the rest of this. No. And that's what I mean by deep science, right? It's, we are talking about really complicated scientific stuff that I need to understand, but you guys don't necessarily need to understand to implement it effectively in your life. And sometimes that's the problem. We see articles that say things and we think, oh, now I need to suddenly be incorporating this thing into my life because that article says this. It's like, well, no, 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 let's back up. That might or might not be true. That might be something like my example. Clearly, I'm pregnant, so I'm going to give that as an example. We talk about how in pregnancy, women need to eat a certain number of calories more per day to help 
fuel the growing baby. The thing with that is though, oftentimes women think, sweet, that means I can eat everything. I'm eating for two now. <laughs> the truth is the amount of extra calories you need in a given day is super low, it's really, really low. And not for nothing, the human body is really cool. And we can actually extract more calories and more nutrition from food if we need to. So sometimes when we're deficient in something, our body will upregulate its ability to absorb that nutrient from our food. Pregnancy, we can't study it because pregnant ladies are considered a protected class and we can't study them. But I would argue that that's true in pregnancy, is that my body is more efficient at getting <coughs> calories and nutrition out of food than y'all's is. Because it has to, right? Not for nothing too, it also sucked nutrition from my body. My arms were way more jacked in the summer. <sighs> Super sad. But, you know, I went through the first trimester, I wasn't that hungry, so the baby took the protein off my body. That's what it's there for. That's why I got that way. Partly intentional to do that, because I knew it was gonna happen. So, that's one of those things. It's good for me to know that information, but then sometimes when we have that information and don't understand the context of it, we take it out of context and think, I have to be careful, I have to make sure I'm eating enough, gaining enough, doing that kind of thing. Does that make sense, y'all? Yeah? Okay. So, with evolutionary nutrition, nutrient density is the first and foremost most important thing we talk about. It's not, what are we not focusing on? It's not calories and macros. So again, using the CrossFit, some of you guys may or may not have heard this. In the CrossFit model, the idea was that you were supposed to get consistency and technique first. Then you ramp up intensity, yeah? Come in the box regularly, do it with good form, then go balls to the wall. But what do a lot of people do? They come in, they just go balls to the wall, ah, and then they never come back. <laughs> because they're like, I can't move, like for three days, right? They're just like super sore and crazy, and they hurt themselves, right? because we did too much, too fast, we weren't doing the correct order of operations. Remember PIMDOS back in the day, order of operations? Um, I view nutrition the same way. I think we have put the cart before the horse and we have a tendency to focus on calories and macros because they're easy, they're numbers to talk about. It seems like it makes sense and works. We're gonna talk about again why maybe it doesn't, but really what you need to get first is nutrient density consistently and then maybe we need to talk about macros and calories. But for most people, that actually figures itself out. For a lot of people, when we can correct the beginning, nutrient density, and eating that way normally, you'll figure out what works for you. Maybe you work better on higher protein. Maybe you work better on higher fat. Maybe you work better on higher carbohydrate. I don't know, but we'll know through experimentation, and usually you'll figure it out when you start eating nutrient-dense foods. Your body kind of finds its equilibrium. It's really cool how that happens. It's just it's this nutritional wisdom that we all have, right? Like, we trust that when our dog is eating grass, like, that there's a reason for it, that they need to, right? Cool, your stomach's upset or whatever. Why don't we trust that for ourselves? Why don't we trust that we have that too? Because we absolutely do. Now, granted, when you're eating Twinkies, that corrupts the signal, <laughs> so it doesn't work. <laughs> but when you're eating real food, that signal comes through. And you can actually start to find that, that it ebbs and flows. And maybe one day you're super hungry and you wanna eat all the food. And the next day you're like, you know what, I'm not that hungry. And that's cool. You're not gonna die from not getting your protein macro goal set that day, I promise. If that was the case, how would we have survived as a species? How would we have gotten here if we needed X number of grams of protein every single day? We wouldn't, right? Our body is really, really plastic and very adaptable. And that variability and that adaptability is actually what makes us healthy. So, we're gonna talk about calories in, calories out. Kaiko, bro it's a broken model. So, I'm sure we all know this, right? Calories in, calories out. I eat next, X number of calories and I burn X number of calories and if they're equal, isocaloric, I don't gain any weight. If I'm eating more calories than I'm burning, I'm gonna gain weight. If I'm eating less calories than I'm burning, I'm gonna lose weight. Cool, seems like it makes a whole lot of sense. It obeys those laws of thermodynamics, right? I'm sure that's, you know, you guys may or may not have heard that, right? Like this is, it's thermodynamics. It makes perfect sense, cool. Well, thermodynamics applies to physics. <laughs> I am biology. <laughs> doesn't work that way. Part of the reason it doesn't work that way is because, do you guys have any idea how we determine the calories in food? What that process is? Is there some big database somewhere that the government has? It's like, all oh, foods, here you go. 
Hell no. Every single Google search you do is going to give you a different amount of calories for that, that food. If you keep everything equal and you just say, give me 100 grams of almonds across the board, you're going to get like five different answers. Each different one's going to give you a different answer to begin with. That's, yeah, mm -hmm. there is, so like things on the labels, a whole other thing. Um, you can have like on trans fats with labels, they can actually have up to 0.5 grams of trans fat in there and still call it zero. So yeah, there's, there's some legal wiggle room that goes on there, it's tricky. So you have, so the way they determine the amount of calories or the way they originally determine them and a lot of them still stand is they use this machine called a bomb calorimeter can burn this shit down and they can weigh it and do all these things and like okay cool that's how many calories it had in there because that calorie is a unit of heat basically it's how much heat to raise a certain amount of water by a certain temperature level blah 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 so that's a bomb calorimeter you burn it down and then you measure it then you have people eat that poop you burn their poop and then you do some math between the two figure out the difference cool that's how many calories your body got out of that food. That's interesting. <laughs> Especially because they have more recently done some studies where they have isolated people in what are called metabolic wards and they're measuring every single thing that's going in and out and it's like super hyper controlled. And in these metabolic wards, they've discovered that you could eat the same amount of almonds that she could eat and your body's gonna get more calories out of them than her body. That's maybe because your body is more efficient at it, or there's this thing called the microbiome that has become super popular in the last, you know, five years. Um, and we have different microbial species in all of us, and we might have healthier microbiomes than others. And maybe you have microbial species that are really good at extracting nutrients from almonds. So the amount of calories you get is going to be different than the amount of calories you get. Well, that's shitty because if we're believing that we have to keep to that calorie level to maintain, you could be off by like, you know, 30 calories a day, 100 calories a day. And in theory, you're going to gain weight or lose weight by a certain percentage, right? Because it's 3,000. This is how much we say how many calories are in like a pound of fat. That's what we say. So you just have to either intake that much or lose or you know output that much and you're going to gain or lose a pound of fat apparently <laughs> that's how the math works but reality is not that way at all that's why calories in calories out is a little tricky also same thing with if you've ever actually really looked at how many calories you burn when you do any kind of physical activity it's super disappointing <laughs> most of the time it's like holy shit i have to run how far if i want to eat that cookie Damn, I mean, it's insane. Like, I mean, it really is. And then there's also other things too, like again, certain bodies are gonna be better at it than others. Cause there are little tricky things called brown adipose tissue. Who in here has heard of that? Oh, cool, well, <laughs> got a couple of people, right? That, brown adipose tissue. Little bitty babies have it. It's this kind of fat, it's brown because it's got what are called mitochondria in great, great numbers. They are little energy powerhouses and the whole point of brown adipose tissue is to keep those babies nice and warm. It, they burn, fuel burners. We thought forever that adults didn't really have any. Oh, not true. Find that adults do have it. Smaller amounts, yeah, but they do have it. And what they've also been discovering is that part of the reason why we have less than babies is maybe not necessarily because we're not supposed to have as much but because we're not utilizing it. We're not giving our bodies the need to use it. We're, especially in the modern era, we're constantly like temperature controlled. Maybe not in here, it's a box. <laughs> it's a little chilly, which is good, because it means that all of us are having to do a little bit of extra work to keep ourselves warm. But if you're constantly at a nice warm 70 degrees, your body didn't have to do shit. So you're losing something there. Part of the reason why we talk about calories in and calories out is especially from a food perspective and from an exercise perspective is because we can control those variables way more easily than we can control the rest. Most of the, the calories we burn are actually just from living. Standing, breathing, talking. I talk a lot, so I probably burn a lot, huh? No. <laughs> um, digesting, all of these things, right? So, you know, and my basal level is higher period right now. 
can grow in a little thing. So I, that's what I tell my coaches when I get on the assault bike and I didn't get as many calories. I'm like, but mine should count double, right? Because I'm doing it for two. Like I started at a higher level. They don't, they don't listen to me. They don't, they don't buy that excuse. <laughs> but you know that, so that part of it is where we focus because we felt like we could control it. So because we want to be able to control things as humans, <laughs> we want to be, and we also want to be able to put data points on things, right? Especially in CrossFit. We love anything that we can measure, right? We can measure our macros, we can measure our calories, we can measure how many hours I came into the box. And then also with other crazes like Orange Theory and things like that, that also measure your calories that you're putting out. You know, we like that. We like that ability because we want it to work like that. Sadly, biology is real messy. It doesn't work like that. Which is why if you focus on nutrient density, it's gonna figure itself out. And honestly, all the little details, you don't have to stress out about that much. And they will fix themselves. Now, not for everybody. There are certainly people I work with who have spent years and years and years eating in such a way that is so unhealthy that we have to undo some behavior patterns more than anything else. And that's actually true for most people. It's really undoing behavior patterns more than anything else. Reorienting how you approach food. So you have to spend time doing that work too. And that might take some time. You know, I can tell some people, listen to your hunger cues, and that's gonna be nine times out of 10, or you know, 90% of the way for them. They, they get it, they know, they're in tune enough with their bodies. Other people have been ignoring those hunger cues for years. They don't even know when they're freaking hungry. And so they're just not even taking in enough food. And truth be told, that's actually becoming more and more what we're discovering is that it's actually just that people aren't actually eating even enough. And so they might be getting enough calories, but they're not getting enough nutrition. So long as you're not getting enough nutrition, your body actually thinks it's starving from a micronutrient perspective, and it will drive you to continue to eat more. Those foodless calories I talked about before, it's because they really have next to no nutrition in them. Broccoli has nutrition. Pop-tarts do not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> does all that about, does this stuff about calories in, calories out have, make sense? Do you guys have questions? Should I pause here for a second? Do you wanna ask me any questions about this? Okay. Now, the other part of that is macros, which we did mention, yeah. And macros are super popular. Macros, real big with bodybuilding community. Talk about our you know, chicken, rice, and broccoli <laughs> over and over and over again. <laughs> so boring. Um, <laughs> the thing with macros is that they can lead to that nutritionism thing that I was talking about before. If you're just focused on getting carbohydrates in and fats in and proteins in, it doesn't matter what the source is, right? Those can all be processed. It doesn't matter, and that's what we did for a long time. That's what people still do, is if it fits my macros, right? I can get a Snickers bar to fit my macros. Yes, eat that Snickers. And so because I'm focused on the macros, so long as I hit my numbers, I'm good, yeah? Again, though, it doesn't work that way. Is there anything of value nutritionally in a Snickers bar? There might be protein, and they, might, they say there's protein in there. I'm sure there is protein in there, but right. But is that the same thing as me eating, like, a big old steak? Mm -mm. No. There's a whole lot of other crap that goes in there too that my body now has to work to fight against. That's the other part of it too, right? When we eat industrial food, when we eat stuff like Snickers and things like that, it's an assault on our body. Our body, there's other crap in there that our body doesn't know how to deal with. It's not, it's synthetic. It's synthetic food. So a lot of the nutrition you think you're taking in, either A, your body might not absorb it at all, and B, the other nutrition you have in your body is now having to work really hard to deal with that crap <laughs> and, and get it out of your system. Because it's like, we don't like you. You know, you are causing lots of inflammation and all sorts of other problems, so I have to deal with that. So that nutrition isn't going to actually nourish your body, it's just going to mitigate the damage <laughs> from that thing you ate. So I'm not saying that calories and macros are not a part of the picture. This is like what I was talking about with, you know, me knowing that as a pregnant lady, I need X number of calories a day. It's important for me to know that. It is a part of the picture. It should not be the sole focus though. And there, that's because it, is, it can lead to nutritionism and the calories in, calories out model is just broken. It is not the larger picture. Nutrient density and counting nutrients is what's the larger picture. There has been a call within the medical community in the last 10 years or so to stop looking at calories 
to stop looking at macros. Now, not all doctors get this message. <laughs> A lot of them don't, but there is a group and a growing number within the medical community who have noted that we have to stop looking at these as our markers of health and, and nutrition because they just don't get the picture and they allow us to continue to eat foods that are only making us sicker. Nutrient density comes first. I'm gonna talk about what I mean when I say that. <clears throat> One last thing. Carbs is a big one. Again, there's kind of a battle against carbs right now. There was the battle against fat in the 90s. Now we're kind of battling against carbs. Now, I don't, not all carbs are created equal. Not all fats are created equal. Not all protein is created equal. Again, I can say the word fat, and do I mean canola oil or do I mean lard? You don't know. More often than not, I'm going to be talking about lard because that's a great fat. Canola oil, not so much. Um, so when I say the word carb, what do you guys think of? Bread. Bread. Yeah, easy. Pasta. What else? Rice. Rice. What else? Potatoes. Potatoes. Vegetables. Thank you. Veggies are carbs. Veggies are absolutely carbs. So it's fruit. So you see I actually said dense carbs. That's because to me, like pasta and rice and all those other things, those are dense carbs. You get a lot of carbohydrate and not much else. If you stop and think about those things, bread, pasta, rice, okay. Those are all modern foods. Now, certainly, there are cultures that have been eating those foods for longer than others. But if you go back farther, they're still pretty frickin' modern foods for the human body, the human animal, because that's what we are, we're all animals. They are still pretty new. And they are certainly new on a worldwide level, yeah? We think of pasta, what's, what do you guys think of first? What culture? Italian, Italian. except. The Chinese invented them. So, you know, Julius Caesar wasn't sitting there twirling a thing of carbonara while he was about to, you know, cross the, cross the Rubicon. That's a really new food. Tomatoes, pasta sauce, those come from the New World. Those wouldn't even have been there until Columbus crossed the ocean blue. What the hell? Well, a little before that. But tomatoes have not been in the Italian diet that long. But yet these things that we think of as being Italian food only a you know, few hundred years that they've really been eating them with any kind of consistency, it's not that long at all. So we have to realize that where these dense carbs come from in our diet are actually not real food sources. Because I know a lot of people with paleo are like, how am I gonna get my carbohydrates in? I have to have my carbohydrates in, I need those carbs. Stop and think about where those carbs are, carbs are coming from. If they're coming from modernized food, do you think your body then needed them? How did our ancestors, and I'm not even talking paleo, I'm talking like 500 years ago, how did they survive? They weren't eating the carbohydrates like we are today. It wasn't in every, literally everything they put in their mouths. Or and go farther back. How did we get to that place, right? We had to get there somehow. We have been around for thousands of years. So go back even farther. How did our hunter-gatherer answers, how do modern hunter-gatherers survive without bread and pasta and those carbohydrates? Well, they do pretty well and damn, they look better than most of us. Like, I wish I looked like a Husda Bushman. Dang, that'd be great. You know, um, so we have to think about where these things come from. But I don't want to demonize carbs because carbohydrates are bigger than just bread, rice, pasta. And that's the other problem with nutrition is we use words and we don't define them, right? Someone will say carb. You might be thinking sweet potato, you might be thinking bread, I might be thinking broccoli. Well, crap, we're all, those are way different things. Okay, now, what do you do with this information? <laughs> I'm throwing a lot of crap at y'all. What do you do with it? How do you apply it? This is really what we wanna know, right? Basically, just tell me what the fuck to eat. <laughs> That's what 90% of people want from me, right? Just, I don't care. Just tell me what the fuck to eat. So, what to eat? <laughs> Real whole nutrient dense food. So, I've used this term a lot. I'm gonna talk about nutrient density now. By the way, I'm gonna give you guys, we're gonna take a break in a minute. I want you guys to get up, do some air squats. You know, it's interesting when you look at most hunter-gatherer tribes and when you look historically at them, they actually work less than we do. 
they, you know, they usually, they, they, there's this myth that they were out there like running marathons every day. They were moving a lot throughout the day, absolutely. But they had, they did have those different lifestyles. So yeah, the evolutionary model, you're using all of the historical data. You're also looking at modern um, examples now, both in the hunter-gatherer world, which there are less and less and less of them, but also in um, the modern peoples, and you're looking at industrialized cultures and how you know France is different than America and stuff like that too. You know, there's the French paradox, which I don't know. You guys have heard about this concept of the French paradox, like how can they eat all this fat and still be super skinny? It's like there's no paradoxes. We got something wrong <laughs> in our understanding. But yeah, does that answer your question? Were you I, I mostly just wanted to, know to clarify? How Yes, yeah. Um, so as I said, like it includes all of those sort of things in that list that I talked about and that, that would include understanding things about differences in lifestyle factors because they play a role, absolutely. Sleep, that's a big one. Most of us are not getting a lot of sleep and that sleep can then impact how our bodies deal with nutrition. If you get less than like six hours a night and probably more like less than seven, you're gonna wake up in the morning and your body's not gonna be able to handle insulin very well. You are automatically what's called insulin resistant which means your body, your blood sugar is gonna be high. Just period. That's just lack of sleep. So also testosterone. You get too little sleep, those T levels are going down. That's not good either. We don't wanna do that. We gotta get those T levels up. So nutrient density, what I mean by that is I don't need you to sit there and count how many nutrients are in any given food that you're doing. Really what it is is more like when you look at broccoli and if you look down the line, it's got pretty much something in every single column, right? I don't care how much vitamin C it has specifically. I care that it has C and magnesium and potassium and manganese and all of the other things, right? That's what I'm looking for is just packing in as much density as I can get. It's getting as much nutrient density per caloric buck as you absolutely can. Don't worry about absolute numbers. That will take care of itself. But you have to think about nutrient density. And whole food, real food has become such a movement. You hear people throw this word out there all the time. KFC is now writing on the side of their buildings that they do real food. Because apparently, the they, apparently they make it in-house. Maybe they do, I don't know. But I'm sorry, that's not real food. That's not, again, that is not the same thing as broccoli and a nice piece of steak on your plate. Just not. Does that make sense, what I mean by nutrient density? Does that clarify that? Foods that look more like what your ancestors would have eaten. I don't necessarily mean your Paleolithic ancestors. We're not having to go that far back, but definitely your grandparents and great-grandparents. If you walk in the grocery store today, up to 80%, depending on your store, of the food in that store did not exist 100 years ago. It's that new, it's that novel. 80%, that's a lot, It's a lot of stuff. And 70% of all the calories, like just sort of the mass amount of food that's, that's um, created in the US, 70% of that is derived from three different things, corn, wheat, and soy. 70% of all calories created in the US are just from three different things. That is not variety. We might think we're getting variety because we're eating Chinese food one night and Mexican the next, and then maybe some Italian, but the component parts that went into that food, 70% is all from those three things. No variety there. And can you just count the ingredients on your plate? Can you look at your plate and know what's in it? Most of the time we can't especially when we eat out somewhere else. Like, oh dear Lord, have you ever read like the list of ingredients at any like restaurant or fast food joint? I can't, I can't pronounce half those words and I studied Latin and Greek for years. <laughs> yeah, those, I mean, these are just, these are, you know, $10 words. We don't need that in our food. Like, and I don't even care if it says ascorbic acid, which, you know, is technically derived from, you know, nutritional food. It's still ascorbic acid. Like, I'd rather eat the actual food and get it that way. So, um, I'm going to pause there. Because I've been going for an hour, and you guys have been sitting on your butts for an hour. I'm going to give you, like, five minutes. Get up, go to the bathroom, do some air squats, do something. Couch stretch, love it. Get that couch stretch in. Just going to take a quick break, let you guys do that. <laughs>